Well, good evening, everybody. I'm Mark Bowick. I'm Deputy Director of the uh, KITP, and I'd like to welcome you to this evening's event. This is our 81st public lecture, so that's a, it's a beautiful number, perfect square. <laughs> and uh, tonight we'll be featuring Prof Professor Richard Neer, who will tell us about uh, lessons from other viruses, how pandemics uh, begin and end. Very timely topic, and uh, he's an expert on the subject. Uh, I'd first of all also like to send greetings, regards from our leader, our director, Lars Bildston, who cannot be with us tonight. The format will be uh, roughly a 45-minute lecture, followed by about 15 minutes of Q&A. Uh, I would like to welcome and thank the generous friends of the KITP who make these events possible, make, make it possible for us to bring these kinds of events to the entire community. And I would also like to encourage those of you who are not uh, friends of the KITP to consider joining this uh, curious and vibrant community and allow you access to special events that we have like uh, the chalk, our chalk talks and coffee with a scientist and reserved seating and advance notices about all of our public lecture events. And finally, I would like to introduce uh, Professor Boris Schreiman. He's a permanent member of the KITP and the Susan F. Gurley Professor of Theoretical Physics and Biology at UCSB, who will introduce tonight's speaker. Thank you, and I'll uh, be up here again for the Q&A after the talk. Thank you, Mark. Um, welcome, one and all. Um, so my role here is to, to introduce uh, my good friend, uh, Richard Nair, who is uh, a professor at Biocentrum in uh, Basel in Switzerland. Uh, Richard is uh, trained as a theoretical physicist. He got his PhD in Munich, uh, after which he came to KATP. So uh, we, 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 we claim uh, Richard as our alum. Of course, uh, at KATP we have a very broad idea of what physics is. KTP physics stretches from elementary particles to black holes all the way to the frontier of uh, biology. So what, what we call physics of living matter. So when Richard came to KTP, he started working on dynamics of evolution. And uh, of course, when you think about evolutionary dynamics, you have to think about viruses, because viruses, for better or worse, mostly for worse, are the fastest things to evolve. Um, so take influenza, for example. Every season it comes back having evolved just enough to get away from our acquired immunity. So when uh, Richard continued working on uh, influenza after leaving KATP, he encountered uh, sort of a major roadblock to his research and the work of others, which was the lack of uh, genomic data, lack of access to genomic data. So getting together with um, a colleague from Seattle, he solved the problem once and for all for everyone by creating a database which consolidated and analyzed all genomic data from viruses as they uh, were first sequenced and, uh, and, and appeared. Um, so they started with uh, influenza, but uh, then broadened to uh, monitor other emerging viruses. Now, remember Zika in uh, 2016? Well, so when COVID-19 first appeared on the horizon in uh, the winter of uh, 2020, uh, Richard and his collaborators found themselves at uh, the frontier of uh, uh, COVID surveillance and, uh, and research. And their work early in the pandemic was central to uh, identifying and tracking uh, local transmission clusters in the U.S. and, uh, and, in, and in Europe. So, Richard is really the foremost expert on uh, COVID variants. 
but he's not going to talk about uh, these details today. Instead, he's going to give us uh, sort of a very broad view of pandemics as a natural phenomenon driven by evolution. And uh, of course, uh, his view of the subject is really informed and driven by uh, his deep understanding of uh, dynamics of evolution. And uh, with that, let's hear from, from Richard. Uh, Richard? <laughs> Thank you very much, Boris. Um, thank you all for coming. It's uh, my pleasure to be here and uh, tell you today about, um, yeah, lessons from other viruses, how pandemics start and end. And I sort of picked this topic and title because you know, I'm aware that for two years now, sort of one headline is chasing another. And <clears throat> yeah, but there isn't really sort of a good way to keep up and sort of keep something relevant for sort of an extended period of time. So that's why I wanted to step back a bit and sort of ask, you know, what, you know, in this pandemic, everything seems new every day, right? And everything seems unprecedented and so forth. And that's, you know, in some, in some ways this is true, but in other ways there's also a lot that we can actually learn by, from looking at what happened previously in pandemics. This is not the first pandemics to happen. And we, we understand by now pretty well what happens at the interface between humans and animals. And this is sort of the grand scheme that I want to cover, cover today. And you know, just to, 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 to hit things off, of course, you know, pandemics are a recurring phenomena in human history. And you know, one, of the, one of the best known ones is um, you know, probably the Black Death as it spread through Europe in the 14th century, sort of actually eliminating a substantial chunk of the Euro pop European population at the time. Then sort of in, for some still living memory, um, for the very old ones among us, um, the Spanish flu, of course, is, um, is the, 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 the paradigmatic pandemic that sort of hit right after the first World War and caused sort of unprecedented levels of, um, of mortality, in particular in sort of the in, in sort of the age group of young adults at the time. And what you see from this picture, which is actually taken in the U.S., that you know many of the problems that we have faced over the last two years, sort of regarding sort of enforcement and proper wearing of masks, <laughs> were also were also sort of an issue about a hundred hundred years ago. So not everything has changed. There's some things we can learn um, here right uh, right away. Now, I'm mostly going to talk about viruses. So the Black Death was caused by a bacterium. I'll mostly talk about viruses, um, the, the agents, for example, like the influenza virus that caused the Spanish flu. And just to make you know, sure that we also start from the same page, I'll give you sort of a very cartoonish um, view of what, what viruses are. And you know, very, very briefly, a virus really is not much more than a shell around a genome. Right? And you know, what the shell does, it ensures that the genome gets from one person to another, from one cell to another. And the genome is sort of an instruction manual how to make more of the thing, right? More of this virus. And this here is, um, is, is sort of a, an artist's depiction of an influenza virus with the genome here sort of coiled up. This is an RNA genome. Um, and the shell being sort of derived from the human cells, decorated with proteins, the sort of neuraminidase and the hemagglutinin. So the virus life cycle sort of looks roughly like this. So the, the egg-shaped thingy here is, is, is meant to depict a cell. The virus here docks onto the cell. Each virus uses a specific receptor. Sort of influenza uses sort of sialic acid. Um, COVID-19 uses the ACE2 receptor, which you have, might have heard about um, in, in sort of reporting on, on the pandemic. Um, after docking the virus, one way as it, as it gets into the cell, then sort of releases its cargo, its genome, which then is used either in the nucleus or somewhere else in the cell to produce the building blocks of, of new viruses, which are then assembled and sort of come out. And in such a replication cycle, um, it is not uncommon that one virus will give rise to thousands and thousands of progeny viruses. Right? And this, this allows um, a viral infection to really expand very, very rapidly. It just takes a few replication cycles to go from you know, a handful of variants to billions and billions of variants in your airways, for example. It just, it just takes a few, a few cycles um, so that within a few days, two, three days, you are infectious and spewing the virus all over once, after you've gotten infected. All right. Um, 
So the first the first question I want to I want to touch upon a little bit is sort of where do these where do, where do viruses human viruses come from, and what do we know where they came from? So how do we figure this? Um, okay, where they come from, this is sort of um, summarized here in this little slide. For most of these viruses, most of human viruses, we have a pretty good idea of where they come from. Um, and this is summarized here from the most um, prominent uh, pandemic pathogens, first and foremost up here. So that would be um, COVID-19. It came from, from bats, fruit bats. Um, Ebola actually similarly comes from bats. Bats seem to be a reservoir where lots of these viruses uh, circulate. Other sort of common sources of, uh, of human pathogens are, are rodents. So smallpox, for example, came, came, came from rodents and then also was obviously spread by humans. So this, nine, this 1520 pandemic here, that is a pandemic in the New World, sort of brought, brought here by the sort of people, um, European colonizers. Um, then there are sort of the influenza viruses, which, which first and foremost come from poultry. So they are animal reservoir is usually waterfowl, but then the human interface is usually is, is poultry, sort of domestic birds that are being that are being farmed, where there is sort of a very tight interface between the animals and humans, but also pigs, which sort of serve as an intermediate host often between between the avian hosts and um, and, and humans. And another prominent group are of course um, you know the other primates which, for example, gave um, you know, HIV to, to humans, or giving it to humans is maybe not the right word, right? Humans were hunting them, and, <laughs> and, and in the process, um, some humans got infected in, in, the, in the last uh, decades of the, of the 19th century. That probably happened three, four times, and one of these gave rise to the, um, to the HIV-1 pandemic, which has caused uh, many, many tens of millions of um, cases and deaths since um, in the last hundred years. So how do we know all of this? How do we find out you know, where the viruses that circulate in humans come from? Most of that sort of now happens through comparisons of their genomes. And um, you know, as I already said earlier, viruses are basically defined by the genome. They don't really have many other bits and pieces. And um, these genomes are either RNA or DNA. Many human pathogens are, are RNA viruses, but there's also, also a bunch of, of, of DNA viruses. And we can now sequence these genomes in very large numbers. It's become very cheap and very, very, very um, ubiquitous to sequence the genomes of these viruses. Um, also humans, of course, but I'm talking about viruses. And what this looks like then that you get a genome sequence, which is a long string of letters, A, C, G, T. Right, and long here means for viruses somewhere between 5,000 to you know, 30,000 for SARS-CoV-2, and then there's some sort of special viruses which are a few hundreds of thousands, but mostly in the few tens of thousands of letters. By comparison, the human genome is 3 billion letters, so much, much bigger. Um, and these genomes, they are being copied by, by the viral replication machinery in each replication cycle. And the viral replication machinery tends to be rather sloppy. So every once in a while, typically every other replication cycle or so, you find that one letter in this genome changes, for example, here from G to A or C to T. Um, and it is these changes accumulating gradually that allow us to establish a lot of connections between viruses and different hosts, and also viruses along transmission chains and so on. So and I'll, be, I'll be sort of um, illustrating this in the, coming, in the coming slides by, so the genome just being sort of a black bar and changes on this being denoted by these little colored circles. Some of these um, mutations, um, they change the viral properties, and this is what we've been experiencing um, that are very painfully over the past two years with, um, with SARS-CoV-2. They, for example, might increase transmissibility or allow the virus to sort of evade immunity. These are typically a minority of the mutations, so the majority of the mutations in some way or another sort of makes the virus actually less good. They destroy sort of a well-adapted machinery. But these few mutations that do help the virus, they are the ones that tend to spread and, and cause, um, cause big outbreaks and so forth. Now, if we sequence a bunch of viruses here, you know, that's sort of my genome de depiction, it is sort of pretty intuitive how we can use comparisons of their genome sequences to get at um, their sort of you know, their ancestry, their history, right? It's kind of obvious that here A and B, these are identical sequences, so likely they shared a common ancestor in the recent past. Um, before then maybe joining with the virus C that sort of had a common ancestor with, um, with A and B at some point later in the past, they share um, the, it, 
So the virus C shares the mutation, the yellow and the blue mutation with A and B, but differs in the, in the, in the green and the, the blue, and then and the green and the red. And then at, the, at, at last, this group of viruses will join with, with, with this group of viruses, D and E. So comparing these genome sequences, looking at similarities between these sequences, we can, uh, we can deduce something like a family tree or phylogenetic tree of these viruses and sort of tell quite accurately which viruses are closely related and which ones are not. And we can actually also use this to estimate sort of reasonably accurately how far in the past these sort of branch points, these splits have been. And this works because these viruses accumulate a mutation roughly every two, three, four weeks, depending on the virus. For SARS-CoV-2, it's about one mutation every two weeks, meaning that is sort of the, the elementary scale on which we can sort of try to measure time and distances. And, and yes, yeah, so, but this is not only, not only applicable on these very short time scales, we can also look at this on time scales of millennia and many thousands of years, where then instead of just a few handful of mutations, we'll be looking at hundreds to thousands or tens of thousands of mutations. And you know, when, we, when we then you know, find a new, a new virus, a new virus that we haven't seen before, the first thing we'll do is we'll sequence it and we'll compare it to sort of a database of animal viruses and find sort of close, close partners, right? And you know, these animal to human transmissions, um, one might, might, might not quite be, be aware of that, but they happen all the time. They happen you know, thousands and thousands of times every day, right? Um, and whenever you see a cluster of multiple such cases, then that is sort of a, you know, a sign that maybe you should, you should be investigating this more closely. And the first question that you'd like to ask, is this new virus actually spreading among people? Or is this sort of being transmitted from animals to humans multiple times? And you know, the latter case, this multiple independent transmissions, is actually the, 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 the more probable scenario in most cases. But to differentiate them, if you sequence things, um, you then you, you do a phylogenetic analysis. You do this comparison of, of sequences of, from animals and humans to each other. And you, you'd expect the two extreme cases, repeated spillovers without human to human transmission and spillovers, one single spillover resulting in a spread among humans to have signatures that look roughly like this, right? If you have repeated spillovers from an animal reservoir, you'd expect these human samples to be sort of distributed across animal diversity, and be between most human samples, there should be sort of animal samples that separate things out, right? So different human cases are kind of sampled more or less at random from the animal reservoir. While if you have an, an outbreak, like the one, like, like, the, like the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic, right, you'll see sort of one cluster of human cases that are all very closely related that come from a particular part of the animal tree, um, and this would be sort of clear evidence of human-to-human -human transmission. And in the very first weeks of, um, of, SARS -CoV of the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic, it wasn't actually clear which, in which, 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 which two cases, which, which, which case we are in here. But you know, after, after very, very, only a few weeks, it was pretty clear that we are over here. Um, but what, I, what I'm going to do in the next um, sort of 15, 20 minutes or so is you know, talk you know, show you sort of various examples, sort of starting on this end of the spectrum and ending on that end of the spectrum, just to give you give you give you a sense how common and how um, you know how well understood these different scenarios are. And actually, this this, as I said, it happens all the time. Basically, when people, for example, get bitten by a tick and get sort of you know tick-borne disease, right? This would all be a case like this, right? We don't spread these among humans, but they are sort of multiple. They're sort of repeated transmissions. From humans, um, from animals to humans, human to animal transmissions exist too. Only that we tend to be much less interested in those. But <laughs> <laughs> but it is actually quite common. In particular, farmers giving uh, giving influenza to their pigs, um, or us giving COVID to deer uh, to to deer, as we as you might have read in the in the news. Anyway, so sort of one one sort of very oh yeah, this this is sort of. You know, this is sort of the, um, the, the, the graph on which I'll be displaying these different, different scenarios sort of going from, from here to here. And you know, this, this, this first case where you have sort of isolated spillovers that don't really spread, they sort of look basically like this, nothing much happens, right? You have this you know, an individual case, so maybe an outbreak in a household or something like that. And each individual spillover from animals to humans has, has very little impact, right? So 
they, it, it's very short, and it doesn't really, you know, the, the case count is, is, is very small. And one of the most, um, you know, the best examples from the past few years of this, uh, of this type of behavior is avian influenza. Um, so there's a particular avian influenza which um, was very common in, in, in the Far East, and it, it spilled over to farmers hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times. And it was actually a fairly severe disease, so these farmers were seriously sick, and quite a few of them died. And you see this very clearly here, and this is one of the trees um, from NextTrain that Boris was alluding to, this sort of automated analysis of all available data that we've been running together with Trevor Bedford for the last, um, for the last five, six years. Um, and you see sort of the, the avian sources, so the poultry sources, being, you know, they, that's the reservoir, but they are scattered all over the tree, and the human, the human cases, the red ones, are basically as you know, evenly distributed. Right. And this is sort of you know, a clear example of this, this little toy, toy drawing that I had over here, where we, we, we really have you know, basically sort of dead-end transmissions from animals. And this, interestingly, came to a halt um, after the 2017 season, because that's when um, large-scale vaccination of the chickens was introduced, and basically circulation of this particular virus um, was sort of greatly reduced in, in poultry farms in the Far East. Uh, interestingly, you know, samples here that you get from humans, they often have a very particular mutation at a particular position, so you know, position and the particular mutation don't really matter, but um, this is a mutation that we basically never see in the animal samples, but it's sort of the first step of the virus to getting more adapted to humans. And they, you know, with three, four, five extra steps, that likely would be a virus that is actually transmitting among humans. But this, um, there's this one first step that it needed to, to, to take in order to replicate efficiently in humans. And you see this in a, in a, in a large fraction of all human samples, but basically in none of the, none of the avian samples. So now, moving a little bit towards the sort of spreading among human examples. Um, we'll come to MERS. MERS is an acronym that stands for Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome Virus. It's also a beta coronavirus, somewhat like SARS. It has a fairly high fatality rate, sort of around the order of sort of 10, 15 percent. Um, and, you know, since sort of 20, 2012, it has repeatedly caused, you know, it was repeatedly observed, often in sort of small clusters associated with um, with, with, with camel markets and camel fairs in the Middle East. And it turns out that this, is, this virus is actually circulating quite widely in camels. And it's been transmitted to humans multiple times, again, many dozens of times. But here, instead of just causing a single outbreak or maybe a household cluster, you did have sort of appreciable sort of clusters here. In blue, these are the human, the human clusters. Yellow is the, are, the, are the camel isolates. You do have, you know, sizable clusters um, of, of human outbreaks, um, which, which have been observed mostly in the Middle East. There's sort of one prominent export from the Middle East by sort of, um, you know, a businessman who, who brought it to Korea and then visited multiple hospitals and spread it, <laughs> spread it, spread it there. In a somewhat unfortunate, unfortunate story that resulted in 200 cases and 36, um, 36 fatalities. But you know, even there, you see sort of moving from these really sort of individual spillovers here to small clusters, which still sort of end, to end up burning out very quickly after just a few rounds of replication, but capable of causing, causing outbreaks. So then we come sort of to the next, next stage here, um, transmissions from the animal reservoirs to humans that cause, you know, that have persistent, extensive human-to-human -human transmissions, but which nevertheless sort of can be, you know, this fire can be put out by interventions, by non-pharmaceutical non interventions, and in sort of the later, late, uh, latest last couple of years, also sort of experimental vaccines. And the best example for this would be would be sort of Ebola outbreaks. Ebola outbreaks have been caused by sort of sporadic spillovers of sort of fairly related um, groups of viruses, so the Zaire Ebola virus. Um, there have been several dozen of such notable outbreaks in the last last 50 years. But they typically stay fairly localized. And you know, while they can grow to sort of tens of thousands of cases, and the biggest one in history is the, uh, the known history at least, is sort of the, the 2013 to 2015 West African Ebola outbreak, where we had sort of, um, you know, 
large, um, you know, a large outbreak in Liberia, Sierra Leone and Guinea, with, with about 30,000 cases and sort of 10, 50, 000, 10 to 15,000 fatalities or case fatality rate of about you know, 30, 30, 40%. Um, but in all of these cases, they can be reasonably effectively contained by interventions, you know, partly because, yeah, sort of, we, we understand you know, transmission, we understand the transmission properties sort of reasonably well, and once, once, you, once you manage these outbreaks properly, you can, you can sort of prevent onward transmission very effectively. And that, unfortunately, is quite different from the virus we are dealing with right now which has sort of caused, caused a pandemic. And sort of your typical pandemic trajectory would then look like this. So you have a transmi trans transmission from animals to humans. In the beginning, it might not look, look like much. But then sort of over the course of you know, months to years, often in multiple waves, you have, you have a you know, worldwide outbreaks where substantial fractions of the human population get infected. And then more often than not, eventually it settles into some sort of endemic pattern. And that is sort of what I want you know, to spend most of the, the rest of the lecture on, to um, give you some, uh, some idea what we, what we knew about these sort of patterns before the pandemic and how the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic compares to those um, pandemics that we, that, we, that we have studied in the past. And here, the best, the best example are you know, the, 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 the flu pandemics, influenza pandemics of the last, of the last um, 100 odd years. Where of course the most um, the, the the most well known one here and the most impactful one is the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic. Didn't have anything to do with Spain. It's, a, it's not a very useful name. Um, so it, yeah, so it, it, that started probably in 1916, 1917. Sort of was suppressed by a sort of you know very controlled sort of uh, press during the war. Um, caused you know, in multiple waves, two or three waves, depending on the geography you look at, where this, the second wave was often the most deadly one with you know, a large, large number of people in their 20s and 30s um, dying of the, this, this disease, causing, causing an enormous, enormous number of orphans sort of, and really had sort of a devastating impact on many communities. But after, after sort of um, two or three years, it settled into a more sort of seasonable endemic pattern and kept circulating until the late 50s. When sort of a new pandemic, uh, a new flu strain caused a new pandemic and um, sort of put an end to that one. And this is what I'm going to talk to you about a little more towards the, end of the, towards the end of the lecture. There was a new pandemic that in all likelihood also came from avian sources, so from, some, from, from birds, wild birds to chickens to, to humans, most likely. We don't really know any of the details. Um, this didn't have a very long run, only about 10 years, when it was replaced by the, the 1968 flu pandemic, so-called Hong Kong flu, um, which is still circulating today and causing the majority of the flu outbreaks that we have. And then in the more recent past, um, we, we, have, we have had a, a flu that didn't come from, didn't come from birds, but, um, but, but from swine, probably somewhere in central Mexico. Um, and, um, and that sort of caused the 2009 H1N1 swine flu pandemic, which you know, most of you will, will remember pretty well. Luckily, that was a very mild pandemic because in particular, the most vulnerable people had pre-existing immunity due to the um, circulation of the Spanish flu. Which you know brings me to a brief uh, digression into these, these 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 names and the similarities between them. So as I showed you earlier, the virus, the influenza virus, has the genome inside and on the surface sort of different types of molecules. And one of these molecules is the hemagglutinin, the blue one, and the other one is the neuraminidase, the red one. And those are the ones that are most important for the interaction of the virus with um, with, with the human cells, both for attaching and entering the cell, as well as for the immune system recognizing the cells. And you know, before people could sequence these viruses, they would characterize these viruses by, by looking which, you know, what antibodies react with them. Right? That was sort of a phenomenological way of, um, of differentiating them without you know, seeing what reacts with what. And on the basis of these serological essays, they classified the viruses into or these, or these surface molecules into different types. 
And the first one that we knew was H1, N1, H for hemagglutinin, N for neuraminidase, and they just kept numbering them. So you know, this was the H1, N1 variant, right? So the, and then there was H2, N2. So it had a new hemagglutinin and a new neuraminidase. The H through N2 is the Hong Kong flu. Then we swapped out the the H2, the neuraminidase, for a new neuraminidase, uh, the hemagglutinin, hemagglutinin for a new hemagglutinin, while keeping a similar neuraminidase. So that was then the H3N2. And the swine flu, so the 2009 H1N1 pandemic, happened to have the same type of H and N as the Spanish flu had. And this Coincidence, which isn't really a coincidence, because likely the Spanish flu, um, or this flu pandemic, results in infection in, of, of, of pigs, in which the original Spanish flu propagated for decades and decades, and at some point came back. But um, that meant that people that have been exposed to this, to this virus had some residual immunity against that, and that sort of made had the result that. The, the swine flu pandemic wasn't nearly as bad in terms of mortality and morbidity as one could have as one could have feared, given that this was a virus that is similar to the Spanish flu. Anyway, that's sort of how these names come about. But the swine flu, um, I call it a swine flu, the 2009 H1N1 pandemic of swine origin, <laughs> so that's the, 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 official, the official name, is, is very well documented. And we can use that to, sort of, to gauge a little bit of what to expect of a pandemic, how it, will, how it will sort of run through the human population and eventually settle into an endemic, an endemic sort of more equilibrium type circulation. And what I have here on this slide, these are influenza positive tests. Now, similar to the positive tests that you read in the New York Times every day today for, for COVID, um, these are collected by the US CDC every week. Um, and this, this is the dynamics, you know, not nearly on the scale as we do this now, but you know, still sort of a pretty, pretty good surveillance activity that has been going on for decades. And you know, pre-2009 pre, pre pandemic, we had the, the 1918 H, well, descendants of the 1918 H1N1 and descendants of the H3N2 pandemic, right? They were seasonally circulating. And in most years, you have, well, in all years, you had a defined peak. So that is sort of the, 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 flu, the flu peak in, the, in winter that sort of happens basically every year. And about two thirds of the years, it's, it's the H3N2. And then other years, it's the H1N1. And that was sort of a fairly predictable Pattern. Sometimes the peak was a little higher, sometimes a little lower. In some, in some years, you have core circulation of both, but you know, it's a fairly, fairly regular pattern. Only until you know, 2009, after the flu pandemic, the, 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 the normal flu season was essentially done, we suddenly saw a new virus popping up. Of course, in the southern United States, well, in Mexico, southern United States, and from there, sort of within weeks, everywhere that you know, disrupted this pattern. So we, we suddenly had an enormous peak, which in early summer, um, then sort of a little bit of a break in midsummer and a fall and another fall peak followed by, followed by a bit of a, a quiet period in, the, in, in sort of 2010. And you know, of, course, of course, this is also accompanied then by sort of much more testing for a little while. You see this, this peak here of the green, that's basically just because they started testing a lot, lot more within a few weeks. Um, but basically, you had this new strain, which wasn't terribly severe, but which was different enough that within, within a few weeks, it could spread across the world and sort of cause, cause um, a, a caseload that was you know, orders of magnitude higher than sort of the usual, the usual flu pandemic. But then it sort of very rap rapidly became normal again. Testing levels increased sort of after the 2009 um, pandemic, we ended up testing a lot more. So these peaks here are actually kind of comparable to that um, just because there's a lot more resources that went into that sort of surveillance. And that sort of then went on until 2020 with sort of the um, 2009 H1N1 replacing basically the, 2000, uh, the 1918 H1N1. There's no more blue peaks over here. It's all the, all the peaks are yellow. Um, that is sort of the, the, old, the old flu was gone. Until then sort of COVID came and 
we didn't have we didn't have flu for about a year and a half, um, and the H three sort of came back in the U S in the U S this winter, and then the coming in the coming season we'll probably also see the H ones again. Now I want to zoom in a little bit into this because that is that is sort of the closest um, example of something SARS-CoV-2 like that we that we have recorded. Right? And if you zoom in a little bit, it, 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 it sort of looks like this. So you had the, the H1N1 peak, the normal flu season that I've told you about. Then, yes, this large peak in sort of early summer, sort of late spring, early summer. Um, and then basically when schools opened again, sort of after in, in, in sort of early fall, an even higher peak um, that you know, didn't last very long. It sort of came down basically by the end of the year. And then you had, um, you had, you had sort of quite a quiescent period for a while. Obviously, COVID wasn't quite as sort of short-lived. This COVID, we've now gone through more waves through sort of a longer period of time. But when it comes to its transition to endemicity, this is sort of still probably sort of our best, our best example. Sort of after the, after the 2009 pandemic, we then, yeah, got this, as I already mentioned, this sort of fairly regular um, pattern again, where out of you know, but about three out of um, two, uh, two out of three years are H3 and two dominated, and the remaining years are H1 and one dominated. And we do know that, especially serology in young children, that about 50, you know, at least 50 percent of the population in many parts of the world got infected within that within that time window of about a of about a year. So this, this really was a pandemic swept across the globe like, like COVID does now, only that was luckily about a hundredfold as bad. And that, that sort of ends up making, making all the difference. So now, um, yeah, so this transition to endemicity, which is sort of obviously what, we, what we'd really like to understand um, for COVID now, right? Because this is sort of what everybody's waiting for. We know it's not going to go away, but so how is it going to settle into something that we can manage, right? And you know, fundamentally, you know, here this happens sort of reasonably smoothly. Fundamentally, what it requires, it's some sort of balance between infection and immunity, right? And you know, ideally, much of that immunity comes from vaccination, but we, we, we seem to have realized that you know, vaccination alone isn't going isn't to cut it. We do have infection as well. And we are sort of, you know, endemicity then sort of is, is a state essentially where circulation of the virus and so the buildup of immunity and loss of immunity are in some sort of ba balance. Because endemic circulation requires sort of a more or less steady supply of susceptible host, which could sort of come about in various ways. Right? One would be that immunity of a previous infection or vaccination just you know, decays, goes away with time. And then over time, sort of more and more, you know, larger and larger parts of the population become susceptible again, get reinfected, and hopefully vaccinated before that, and the immunity goes back. There could also be change in the virus, so that the virus changes such that it can reinfect parts of the population that have immunity against previous versions of the virus. And of course, you know, population turnover is also something that could support an endemic state. Population turnover meaning the birth of new babies, right, that don't have immunity against any of the pathogens. And you know, one example of the latter would be the measles virus, pre-vaccine, the measles virus would basically infect every child in their first years of life. And measles virus propagated by being extremely good at extremely rapidly infecting all the kids, right? It, there was sort of very little reinfection of the adults. So adults, once they were immune, they didn't contribute to viral circulation in a meaningful way. Um, this is the quote unquote strategy of the measles virus here is clearly going after the naive kids as quickly as they can. As it can. Influenza, on the other hand, is basically on the other end of the spectrum. Right? Influenza, as we most of us are painfully aware, it, it frequently reinfects adults. And it does that mostly through sort of viral evolution. Sort of the virus changes, changes its surface proteins to escape previously existing immunity, escape, you know, reduce the binding of antibodies so that it can be reinfected again. And waning of immunity also contributes to influenza, influenza, um, uh, yes, sustained influenza circulation. And SARS-CoV-2 really is pretty much in this camp here as well, right? So this is something that we've we've become, um, you know, 
again, very painfully aware. So for, for, for influenza, this looks, this looks roughly like this. So what I'm showing here in this graph, it's again one of these family trees, you know, organized by time of influenza H3 and 2, where the color here um, indicates how antigenically different the virus is from the ancestral version. And each color change corresponds to one particular, you know, one, one mutation in the virus that means that this virus is no longer recognized as well by previously existing antibodies. So with each, with each of these changes, there is a sort of a reinfection possibility of some fraction of the population. And you know, for this reason, Boris alluded to that earlier, um, the vaccines, the flu shots that we get every year, they need frequent updates. And there's actually sort of a standing WHO committee that meets twice a year to decide what representatives of the circulating viruses are supposed to go into the vaccine um, and uh, into the flu shot that we, that we get. And you know, much of this work um, on, on next strain and sort of tracking the flu and also sort of trying to predict the flu has been um, motivated by trying to make the selection process better. And you know, the WHO and the WHO Collaborative Center for Influenza, they are using these analyses that, that we provide here to have an up-to-date overview of what is, what is going on. Uh, but each of these black crosses is actually one of the viruses that they ended up picking over the past decade or so. And um, they're basically sort of playing catch up, right? Sort of they're trying to, trying to have the best possible representatives of the, of, the current, of the current vaccine. So the current vaccine is this strain here. Um, what's circulating is over here, so the future vaccine is going to be here. Unfortunately, this is not what's in the, you know, there is an important change that happened here. Um, which isn't yet represented in the current flu shot, but will be in the southern hemisphere flu shot that's coming up, and then also in our flu shot in the coming winter. Um, hopefully, until then, no additional changes happen that might sort of uh, <laughs> might might invalidate this choice. But this is basically the situation for influenza. We have a rapidly evolution, uh, evolving viral population that constantly changes, um, and we have a vaccine that is constantly being updated to keep up with it. Importantly, this is sort of a fairly gradual process where sort of one variant sort of, sort of emerges from the next. And this is one way in which uh, influenza is very different from SARS-CoV-2. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that now. So the remainder of the talk is mostly going to be COVID-19. So um, over the past two years, we have, we have observed this sort of you know, this stunningly rapid evolution of SARS-CoV-2. You know, the, the variants of SARS-CoV-2 have been, have been um, subject of, 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 of lots of lots of headlines. So as Boris said, we've been, we started to track this, the evolution of SARS-CoV-2 in the very early phases of the pandemic in January 2020. Um, and you know, for much of 2020, not much was happening. We were sort of identifying different variants and sort of tracking them, but none of them actually had any sort of meaningful phenotypic effect. There was sort of one mutation which was important, um, but beyond that, all these mutations just seem to be sort of random changes in the virus that, that didn't change the dynamics of the pandemic. But this changed rather rapidly in, in, late, um, in late 2020, when the first variants of concern, alpha, beta, and gamma, were identified. This happened sort of basically right before Christmas um, in, in, in 2020, sort of ruined my Christmas. Um, <laughs> quite literally so. <laughs> um, um, but these two variants, they were more transmissible, and to some extent, especially sort of beta and gamma, sort of somewhat immune evasive, and caused for a, a large resurgence um, of, of, of SARS-CoV-2 circulation across the globe. Alpha originated in the UK, beta originated in, um, in sub-Saharan Africa, and gamma originated in, in, in South America. So these were these first, the first set of um, variants of concern that the WHO then sort of um, designated. But you know, they, 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 they dominated for a few months, this is sort of this period here, before being basically completely replaced by variant Delta. And Delta is the variant that sort of likely emerged somewhere in the South Asian subcontinent. Um, and from, from there, sort of spread to Europe and then the rest of the world. And it was the first variant that basically blew everything else out of the water. So Delta seemed to be completely dominant 
for, for a couple of months. It, it, it made it to every corner of the, of the world and was the dominate, dominating variant sort of above 90, 95%, basically everywhere. And you know, it looked like that Delta is going to be the variant of the future, which will going to beget sort of the variants um, of the future, the endemic ones and so forth, until in late 2021, in November 2021, Omicron emerged um, sort of rather mysteriously um, somewhere again in sub-Saharan Africa and rapidly swept around the globe. And we are still sort of grappling with the consequences. Omicron itself, um, even it's not just a single variant, it's actually sort of a, a whole array of different variants and we seem to be seeing a bit of um, a sort of a relay race where one variant is sort of making a surge, sort of handing over to the next and so forth. And you know, the success of Omicron is due to substantial immune evasion, um, which allows it to reinfect um, both people that, you know, re reinfect people that it had previously infected or, um, you know, um, leads to a large, a large number of vaccine breakthrough infections. So these variants, they are all sort of characterized by sort of an anomalous amount of changes in the spike protein of the, of the virus, right? And this is sort of depicted here. It's again sort of a rather, uh, you know, somewhat pretty sort of an idealized depiction of, of a SARS-CoV-2 virus with the, um, these, these sticky out bits being sort of the spike protein. It's a trimer of, um, of, of, of a protein, so it has this threefold symmetry. Um, and this is the protein that the virus uses to attach to human cells and enter. It is also the primary target of the immune system. So most antibodies that, that humans make will bind somewhere up here on this spike protein. And it happens to be the, tar the antigen that is in the mRNA vaccines. So in, in the, antigen mRNA, uh, the, the mRNA vaccines contain the instruction to make these proteins um, to, to train the immune system. Spike is the primary locus of, um, of SARS-CoV-2 evolution um, because mutations in spike can prevent antibody binding that lead to immune evasion. They can also make the virus more transmissible. So you know, optimizing spike for human replication has been one of the major um, changes, especially in the early variants, alpha and delta, had sort of um, you know, a, a substantial optimization of the way the, the, the spike protein is processed, which um, allows you know, for faster transmission, more effective transmission, and so forth. And changes in spike can also change which cells the virus can infect. And this, to some extent, might contribute to a reduced um, virulence of Omicron. It tends to sort of replicate less in the deeper lungs, but more in the upper airways, which doesn't lead as often to these sort of very, um, very severe uh, sort of lung, lung diseases. Now, um, you know, all these different variants of concern that I've talked about, they have, you know, important mutations that spike, but Omicron really sort of su surprised everybody because Omicron not just has a few mutations in spike, it has a lot of mutations in spike. And just to, to make, this, uh, make this point clear, sort of I pulled up here um, an, a figure from the UK Genomics uh, Consortium. This is sort of, um, you know, spike protein structure. Um, yeah, for the Delta variant, you have the annotation of the relevant mutation, which are, you know, six, seven, eight, something like that, sort of an enterable number. And if you compare the same thing, do the same thing for Omicron, you see that Omicron has three, four times the number of mutations in spike. So basically every single, you know, important corner of the Omicron spike protein was, mod was, was changed in a way that antibodies um, have, have trouble binding. And one of them is sort of the receptor binding site, which is up here which is you know, in some parts completely modified. And also these flank here of the spike protein, so-called N-terminal domain, which is another important epitope, has, has so many changes that, um, that most antibodies that previously existed don't really work anymore. And the booster shot kind of fixed that problem to a certain degree. The booster shot seems to have kind of um, amplified, amplified antibodies which, which bind sort of the rare patches that don't seem to have changed that much. So that's, uh, that's sort of the good news. But um, it has really been quite astonishing how rapidly and how fundamentally this, um, this spike protein has been changed in a rather short amount of time. Sort of, yeah. <laughs> Making sure I'm, I'm not running over too much. Um, yeah, sort of this, this sort of completely reconfigured 
Omicron also has sort of driven sort of unprecedented levels of, of, of cases, not just in the US as depicted here, but across the world. And um, you know, here you see sort of the cases per million, um, million people sort of broken down by, uh, by variants. So the gray peak here is kind of before we started caring about variants all that much. And then after that, you had, um, you had, you had have this colored by variants, where delta was basically what was dominating the second half of 2021, sort of a continuously high, but never sort of sky high caseload until Omicron came and really sort of shattered all previous, previous records. Luckily, in a population that was sort of to a fair degree vaccinated or already infected, so that the overall morbidity and mortality wasn't quite as high as one would have expected if this had happened earlier. But, um, uh, but still, Omicron has probably infected you know, 30, 30 ish percent of the American population in a rather short amount of time. Similar, similar st things have been unfolding across the world. Sort of Europe has seen similar surges. Um, South Africa, obviously, that's where this started, has seen a similar surge. And um, it is quite remarkable that this little peak of just about you know, two months led to about as many cases as all the circulation before. And this notion um, is further corroborated by sort of an analysis that just um, came out the day before yesterday by the US CDC, where they tested um, convenience samples that were sent in for blood tests. They tested them for um, infection-induced immunity. They tested for antibodies against the, the N protein, not the spike protein, which allows you to differentiate between, um, between vaccine-induced immunity and infection-induced immunity because the vaccine only has a spike protein, but if you get the virus, you get all the proteins. So if you have antibodies against the N protein, those must have come from an infection. And what you see here is this broken down by different age groups over the past, um, past half a year. It was basically pretty steady in, in fall with about 40% of the young people having Having, having an N antibodies and about 15 to 20% of the older people. And this you know, steady state sort of rather dramatically changed in you know, towards the end of 2021, when within two weeks, well, no, two months, um, the level of, um, of young people that were infected increased from about 40 to 75. So almost doubling, if you account for sort of the fact that much of that will also have been reinfection, sort of about twice, you know, you, you got an, an, a comparable number of cases in these two months in all age groups that you had already before. So a good fraction of the population now will have had actually two infections. Currently, we are dealing with a bit of a rooster of sort of different Omicron variants, and you might have picked that up from sort of various, various news reports as well. So there are these BA1, BA2, BA4, BA5, and so forth, right? BA is sort of, um, a sort of fine-grained, so these, these names come from a, this is the Pango lineage classification. It's sort of a fine-grained um, lineage classification system, much more fine-grained than this WHO variant of concerns system, where BA1 is sort of the original that swept, um, that swept South Africa in November 20, uh, 2021, followed by the rest of the world. BA2 largely swept Europe already. Um, you know, places like Denmark and um, ha actually had sort of both of these at the same time, an enormous peak. This BA2 being considerably more transmissible than BA1. The US is currently seeing sort of a rather um, peculiar variant, sort of B.2.12.1. Maybe it'll get a better name <laughs> at some point soon. <laughs> but it is, it is, it is a particular subvariant of BA2 that tends to be even more transmissible than BA2 already is. So it is, it is a sort of doubling compared to BA2 on a time scale of about sort of three weeks or so. It has sort of a 50% um, transmission advantage um, per week over, over BA2 and will likely become the dominant variant in the US in the next, in the next few weeks, probably causing a sort of a rather, rather substantial increase in, in cases. And then there is sort of BA4 and BA5, which have recently been discovered in South Africa. Um, they look like they are spreading, but it's not quite clear yet whether they will be globally successful. So Omicron, with all its diversity, um, has sort of a lot of um, yeah, power to evolve and spread further, and it is really quite unclear 
sort of which one of these um, is going to going to go forward eventually. All right, so a few a few sort of um, you know not quite yet concluding but almost concluding remarks. Um, one thing that's sort of important to realize, which I haven't sort of um, dwelled on so much yet, these variants, even though it might seem so from their naming scheme, did not arise sequentially, right? So we did not have, we, we are not in a situation where some ancestral variant gave rise to alpha, beta, delta, and so forth. This did not happen. Instead, all these different variants of concerns were sort of independent innovations from some ancestral pool. And um, this is something that we, for example, don't see for flu. Right? For flu, we see these more sort of gradual, one variant gives rise to the next variant, gives rise to the next variant, albeit on scales of a decade, not on scales of, of two years. Here, we, we, we really see these sort of parallel sort of variants popping up that all come from some sort of pool that was seeded in early 2020. And that is sort of quite an obvious here in this somewhat messy um, viral family tree where so the beginning of the pandemic really is back here in December 2019. And these variants of concern, they are in color, but all of them basically connect back to a period in the first half of 2020, right after the, the, the initial large outbreaks in you know, pretty much every part of the world other than China. Um, and you know this reservoir that was seeded back then seems, seems, still seems to be the reservoir from which new variants are emerging. And you know one of the central questions going forward is you know when will this behavior stop? When are we going to end up in a situation where the next variant is a daughter of a previous variant? When are we going to see sort of, kind of second generation variants as opposed to these, these, these first generation variants? but we don't yet know when this is going to happen. It could very well be that, yes, Omicron is now the one variant that we that will see the second generation variants, but we said the same thing about Delta. So that is sort of my, you know, my very last um, little bit. So do pandemic viruses, once they've become endemic, ever disappear? I've already told you, yes, that sometimes happens. Um, but otherwise, we'd just be clocking up virus and we be getting more and more and more of them, right? And yeah, I've already told you that in in these in these flu pandemics from the, of the last hundred and something years, um, we have seen sort of variant virus replacements in a way, right? This has happened here um, with with the H2N2 pandemic in '57, which sort of put an end to circulation of H1N1. Then again in '68, that that sort of drove this one out of circulation, and Again, in 2009, when the, the, the 2009 H1N1 pandemic um, drove this one out, which somewhat mysteriously came back in the late, late 70s. So this, this dashed line here sort of indicates that this virus was absent for about two decades and came back in a way that was completely unchanged from the way it disappeared, which probably indicates that this virus was frozen somewhere and, and uh, sort of yeah, we don't really know exactly what happened. But this virus was gone and it came back. <laughs> so H1N1 is kind of the only pandemic virus that has disappeared twice, if you, <laughs> if you want. But sort of how does this happen? Sort of what is it that is sort of driving, driving the, the disappearance of these viruses, the competition? Um, it likely is not so much sort of, you know, there's got to be some, some, some degree of cross immunity, right? So we have an endemic virus, which is in an approximate equilibrium, meaning its R value, so the average number of secondary infections that it produces is around one. So each infection produces on average roughly one. In fall, a little more, that's when the flu season starts. In spring, a little less, that's when it sort of contracts. Um, but it's, yeah, it's sort of running along this, this equilibrium in this somewhat precarious state where it's just about holding on, right? Um, a novel pandemic virus rapidly spreads across the world, sort of causes many more cases than the typical flu season would. Um, and if there is sort of some cross immunity, some interactions of com competition between that novel pandemic virus and a resident virus, that sort of large number of cases will sort of push the R value of the endemic virus below one. Right? 
So the, what is that cross immunity? This is likely driven by T cells because T cell immunity is much broader and sort of longer lasting sort of across different, um, you know, across different viral variants um, than, than antibodies. Antibodies are fairly easy to avoid. You, will, you know, pretty much everybody binds similar bits and pieces of the virus. T cell immunity here is the likely candidate that, um, that sort of mediates this cross interactions between different, different variants. And it is something that you know, does seem to happen at least in the same group of viruses. Not, it doesn't seem to be too uncommon. So there is, in a way, sort of a limited space for influenza viruses in humans. Right? So you, you can't just pile up more and more of these influenza viruses. There seems to be some, some sort of um, yeah, competition for antigenic space within the human population. Interestingly, you know, there is another flu lineage um, which is actually an influenza B. All of these guys are influenza A's. That seems to have disappeared. We don't know, know yet for sure that it has disappeared. This was very rare before the pandemic. And we have not seen a single sample of the influenza lineage B Yamagata since March 2020. And the hope is that this, that this strain is actually gone. Um, which would mean that we could sort of go from the quadrivalent flu vaccine. You might have, have heard about that. The flu vaccines are either trivalent or quadrivalent. That's because they have two influenza A and two influenza B viruses. If one of them is gone, we can sort of make that, that vaccine a little bit less complex or maybe represent sort of more of the diversity of the individual strains in, in, in the vaccine. But yeah, that's, that might, might be sort of a, you know, a beneficial side effect of the pandemic that we've gotten rid of one of the flus. But it's not yet, it's not yet fully, fully confirmed that this is actually true. All right, um, so sort of what are the sort of my expectations for the, for the immediate future of um, SARS-CoV-2? So it's, there's many unknowns, um, but I think what's pretty clear is that it won't go away anytime soon. Um, the next variant could either be yet again, sort of a new variant, like these first generation variants. And that would you know, generate a large amount of uncertainty because we wouldn't really know its transmission pro pro uh, properties again. We would probably well, know it transmits pretty well, but we wouldn't really know um, sort of in which way it is different from the previous one. We wouldn't know its severity profile. Um, and we don't know when and how these variants could emerge. Um, or it could be sort of an Omicron descendant, which we you know would hopefully get us into a regime where we observe a more gradual evolution where sort of changes in the viral properties are not as sort of jumpy with these sort of basically dozens of mutations in one package coming out of the blue, but sort of accumulating more, a little bit more one by one, which would you know, be in some ways more predictable and also expected to result in sort of less dramatic waves, right? So that we see two years into the pandemic, a new variant popping up that within four weeks sweeps the entire globe is, is, is nothing that, that we had, ex had expected and is nothing that we would expect um, in, in a sort of more gradual evolution scenario. So the variant, for example, that's spreading in the US now, it's doubling every three weeks, not every three days, right? <laughs> That makes a big difference in the management of a pandemic. Another thing that is likely going to make things sort of more, more, you know, slow things down and make it sort of more predictable and controllable is that the immunity landscape in which the virus is moving is getting more and more diverse, right? After that initial pandemic and the vaccination campaign, everybody had essentially antibodies against exactly the same virus. Meaning that if there is an escape variant, there's basically one way to escape everybody's immunity. Right? But as different people now have different exposure histories, sort of vaccine first, Omicron, or Omicron first, and alpha, and vaccine, so there is sort of, it becomes sort of more and more kaleidoscopic in sort of how, how the immunity of the population looks like. And that means that any given variant is not going to have complete evasion to everybody's immunity anymore. Right? That should slow things down. That is something that we think happens for flu where you know, the decades of layering of infections and vaccinations means that everybody sort of reacts to the virus in a slightly different way. And the benefit, the spreading potential of any particular variant um, is, is not as absolute. Um, luckily, 
what we've seen so far is the vaccine efficacy against all these different variants um, when it comes to severe disease or death has been very robust and high. And you know, this is probably in large part because T cell immunity is very robust and, um, and the immune system gets fired up pretty quickly to prevent the, the, the really terrible consequences of these severe disease that we see in um, immunologically naive people. Um, vaccine efficacy against symptomatic infection, however, on the, on the other hand, seems to be rather short-lived and sort of quite sensitively depends on sort of the exact spike configuration on the variant, which means that you know, variants like Omicron have the potential to evade existing vaccines, and we likely need sort of booster shots adapted to circulating variants soon. So it's, um, you know, there might be sort of a, a booster adapted vaccine by fall, um, but it's not yet 100% obvious what exactly should go into this, what kind of Omicron variant or beta variant and so forth. Moderna and Pfizer, I think, are both experimenting with different concoctions. Good. So that brings me um, to the end. Thank you very much for, for your attention. Um, yeah, so I need to make a few acknowledgments. Most of what I presented today was based on sort of a, you know, a multi-year collaboration with a group of Trevor Bedford in Seattle, um, where, you know, actually to, at KDP in 2014, we came up with this idea that we should be having a platform where all these sort of phylogenetic analysis, all these sort of viral family trees are present, are, 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 yeah, are viewable and explorable, um, updated as often as, it, as need be every day if necessary, um, and, um, and available to the world. This started, this started um, up in the tower room in, at KDP in 2014 and has grown into sort of a rather large operation since. Yeah, I myself, I'm based at the Beard Center at the University of Basel. I'm a frequent visitor <laughs> at KDP. We're fortunate uh, to, to be able to come back that often. Um, and yeah, sort of, if you, if you feel like sort of fooling around with these trees, go check it out. It's on nexttrain.org. And obviously, there's a large number of individuals that have contributed to this, um, to this enterprise over the last few years. Um, yeah, in particular, sort of James Hadfield, Emma Hartcroft, Thomas Sibley, John Huddle. Ivan Exament of Jover um, and Mora Zuber, um, who are currently sort of keeping keeping the operation going. And with that, yeah, thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, thank you, Richard. That was great. Uh, we can take questions. People can come up to the microphone, or we can bring it to you. Christy has. One over there. I have one here. Ah, we have our first question. Jim. Hi, how are you? I think this is a question, but it seems we got very lucky, in a funny sense, with Omicron, that it was highly transmissible, but not as severe as Delta. It, it, almost like, is, it, is that why the Spanish flu gradually died away, too? The, got things that were more transmissible but didn't kill as many people. But is, is that a, a normal kind of path for these viruses? Um, yeah, so this is, this is something that's been dis discussed a lot. So the, the, the biggest difference with Omicron was that almost everybody had some pre-existing immunity, be it through the vaccine or through a previous infection. So that, that's really what made the, the, the biggest difference. And we see now in Hong Kong and Shanghai, where unfortunately a vaccine coverage, and particularly in the older population, is not as high as it should be, also Omicron can, can cause you know, substantial mortality. So yes, Omicron is a little bit milder, even after controlling for vaccination and immunity status, but it's not actually that, not an enormous difference. The big difference is that it came after we vaccinated. Um, but it's also true that Omicron seems to infect more the upper airways, which you know, is maybe not unexpected because that's where transmission is more, you know, it's hard to transmit from deep down in your lungs, right? Sort of something that replicates in the upper airways is sort of easier, easier to transmit and you know, also then causes sort of less severe disease because that down here is much more, uh, much more vulnerable than, than, than up here. But you know, we've seen this Delta. Delta was a very transmissible variant, more transmissible than before 
which was worse than you know, was most severe than previous variants. So this can go either way. Translation, so selection is for transmissibility, not really for severity. Um, and yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to make a prediction that this necessarily goes one way or the other. Um, I have a question about the ordinary flu vaccine that we get every year. Um, how exactly do they figure out what uh, the vaccine should be? Um, how do they sample, I guess, the people that got the, the flu and how exactly to make the vaccine? And they, there's always some percentage that say, well, it's not going to be 100% effective. How, how does that process work? Yeah, so there, there is so a rather, rather large surveillance activity that involves sort of you know, more than 100 so-called national influenza centers, which sample influenza in their communities. They send these samples to five WHA collaborating centers for influenza, and those centers, they characterize these viruses, both in terms of you know, what antibodies react against them and what kind of mutations changed. And then sort of twice a year, there is sort of first a series of teleconferences and then a meeting in Geneva where sort of these different experts from the WHO and external advisors that sometimes includes me sort of, um, you know, look at all those data and sort of try to, to you know, find sort of the best configuration, the best representative of what we think the future, future virus is. But there are sort of a number of challenges with influenza um, vaccine, one of which is that a large part of that vaccine is still produced in, in chicken eggs, which you know, is sort of a rather, you know, the tried and tested way of doing it, you know, many decades old. But it has a problem that when you make these, when, you, when these viruses replicate in eggs, they sometimes mutate and change their properties because chickens, uh, so chicken eggs, the cells in there, these need to be fertilized chicken eggs, they have slightly different sugars on the surface, which mean that the virus like to mutate to accommodate these sugars. But that sometimes, um, sometimes means that the virus that you end up having in the vaccine is actually subtly different from the one that's circulating and the vaccine doesn't work as well as it should. And many years the vaccine still works reasonably well. It doesn't work, you know, we are now used to vaccine efficacy from the mRNA vaccines that are 90 something percent, right? But that's not really sort of a fair comparison because, you know, the mRNA vaccines against COVID are evaluated compared to naive people which have never seen the virus before, right? In the case of flu, we comparing somebody who got vaccinated with somebody who probably got infected five times in his lifetime already. So, you know, it's, it's sort of harder to achieve a very high, um, high vaccine efficacy compared to that baseline of a population that is kind of already immune, only like a little bit older immune, if you want. But yeah, no, it's a it's sort of a complicated um, process in how these, how these vaccines are, are selected and then manufactured and distributed. And it all happens on about a sort of a nine months um, lead time, um, time scale. And the emergence of the different um, the different families of variants, and I'm just curious if you have a theory around if the, all of those alpha, gamma, delta, whatever omicrons, all, if they all essentially developed from the same ancestor at around the same time, what drove the less infectious and more severe infection domination by one strain as opposed to having a more distributed variant experience and in infections? You know, what, what's causing the, the time-dependent waves of dominance of various strains? Yeah, so it's, a, it's, 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 it's a good question, and it's one to which we don't really have a definitive, definitive answer. So we think that the variant Alpha, for example, that emerged in the UK, um, quite possibly there was a chronic infection involved in an immunosuppressed um, person where the virus sort of circulated in the same person for many, many weeks and months. They were picking up mutations and 
you know, making it sort of more trans it's, it's a bit like an incubator where the virus can, can sort of a, a, adapt. This is less clear for Delta. Delta sort of emerged in, in South Asia, and there's actually quite a few intermediate states, and that might have been sort of more of a stepwise type of evolution. For Gamma and um, Beta, there might also be some episodes of um, chronic infections of immunosuppressed people. It's not so clear. For Omicron, however, that's sort of a, you know, a, a much more extreme evolution, if you want, right? And for Omicron, I think, you know, really the most plausible hypothesis is long-term infection of a single person, or maybe multiple people in a row. But it's not like you're, you know, a series of acute infection that only takes a, you know, one week at a time. There's got to be some process where the virus is in a similar environment, rapidly evolving um, away from an immune system or some, you know, some, some sort of other so strongly selecting agent over an extended period of time. Otherwise, you don't get this rapid accumulation of so many mutations in exactly the same area. So the preferred hypothesis um, out there is that Omicron um, is the result of a chronic infection of an immune suppressed person, for example, somebody who has um, advanced HIV. So you don't think it's possible that it's more of a geographical isolation thing that then once, so, sort of like Ebola, that when it was sort of contained in one area and then travel happened and kabam? So we've been, We've been surveying SARS-CoV-2 much, much, much better than any other disease. And it's you know, pretty much every variant has made it across the globe in sort of a, a fairly, sh fairly short period of time, even at low frequencies, right? And you know, Omicron, you know, it dates back more than a year, right? A year and a half before it sort of suddenly emerged. So if this was circulating somewhere in some population, we should have seen it somewhere, but we, we never did. So transmissible, but not the first one to get out and spread itself wildly, right? I mean, yeah, so, you know, certainly, you know, the, the, the circumstances for it to spread were, were sort of ripe after the Delta epidemic, right? So much of its spreading potential comes from it being so different that it can evade, evade immunity. For that to be a big benefit, you need that immunity in place first, right? And, and that sort of only happened after, you know, after the Delta wave, essentially, right? Delta sort of made sure that everybody who wasn't vaccinated kind of got infected. Um, and, you know, once, once that, was, that was done, sort of in order to spread globally, you really needed to be quite immune evasive. And, and maybe that is, explains, at least to some extent, the timing of the Omicron wave. Thank you, doctor. Um, alpha and uh, delta have been characterized as a vascular disease, not a respiratory disease. Is Omicron and VA2 now still a vascular disease, or is that more of a respiratory? Um, I think, you know, it's more of a respiratory disease. Um, I think also sort of pre-existing immunity sort of does change the pattern how the virus is sort of spreading in the body. If you have a completely naive body, I think there's more potential to sort of to go into all sorts of tissues. Sort of once you have um, pre-existing immunity, I think it stays more in the primary tissues. But this is a question where you, you'd need to consult a medical doctor rather than, rather than a physicist. <laughs> Hello. It has been suggested that yeah, yeah. the virus may be of somehow artificial origin, not transmitted from animals. What is your opinion about that? Well, I think it's it's it's, it's very clear that this virus ultimately comes from from bats. You know, we have we have you know a number of very close relatives of these viruses isolated from bats. And it is, it is clear that that is, that is ultimately the origin of the virus. Where there is, you know, some remaining uncertainty, I think, is sort of how exactly it got to Wuhan. Um, and, you know, that's sort of a long, complicated uh, story with sort of, you know, multiple lines of evidence um, sort of coming together. Um, you know, I personally think that there is some uncertainty remaining. Um, you know, the prevalent hypothesis, or the hypothesis that's being discussed and favored by most people is that it yeah, came to the market via some intermediate host and spread from, spread from there. Um, that 
is possibly the most uh, the most likely scenario, but you know I I personally don't think this is sort of proven beyond doubt. But it is it is probably the most it is the likely most likely scenario given the current state of evidence. But I, I think there is some uncertainty remaining, and beyond that, I can't really say much. There's been uh, some speculation that one of the uh, viruses that gives rise to the common cold, uh, OC43, if I remember correctly, uh, jumped from uh, cattle in the late 1880s. So I'm, and that, because it's a coronavirus, that would be a good paradigm for the uh, SARS-CoV-2. How much have people studied its phylogenetics? How how easy is it to go back and do exhumations or, or other things? Yeah. So yeah. So the 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 the, the pandemic you are referring to is what's what otherwise otherwise known as the Russian flu pandemic um, in in the late um, 1880s 1890s. Um, and yeah, there is some there is some as you say speculation that this might have been OC43, another sort of beta coronavirus that causes common cold in humans. Um, it is not impossible, but the evidence suggesting it is also rather, rather weak, in my opinion. There is some sort of phylogenetic evidence that yes, you know, this might have a common ancestor right around this time, but actually extrapolation of this so far in the past is very difficult. And to my knowledge, there is no archival samples from that time. So we are sort of lucky that we have these samples for the 1918 flu, which comes sort of from permafrost or sort of formaldehyde preserved sort of um, medical specimens. Um, but I'm not aware of, um, of, of similar samples for the, for the whatever was circulating in, in 1880. So at this point, sort of to, you know, in my opinion, it is still sort of more plausible that this was a flu pandemic at the time. But it's, it's, it's hard to tell because yeah, direct, direct evidence, evidence is lacking. So it's all sort of piecing together sort of various clinical descriptions and things like that. And they unfortunately you know, quite overlap quite a lot between these different diseases. It's been reported that uh, COVID will jump to other species. It did. And is this the same strains that uh, the humans have had, or is it a mutation that enables it to make that jump? And what are the implications of this? Um, yeah, no, it's certainly true. Um, the humans have seeded COVID pandemics in various animal populations, um, including the sort of the white deer in, in sort of North and North, and North America. Um, there have also been um, you know, infections of hamsters, of um, you know, cats, um, you know, zoo tigers. So yeah, it, this virus really is somewhat of a generalist that can infect uh, many different animals. And it looks like we have seeded persistent reservoirs of, of SARS-CoV-2 in, in multiple animal species, which comes with the, you know, with the risk of spillbacks, reverse zoonosis um, into, into humans, which you know, might in the future be a source of novel variants, which, you know, would not, you know, which would be a quite unpredictable thing. And actually it has been hypothesized that Omicron might be an example of such, that it might have circulated in rodents, and from there sort of come back to humans, but the favorite hypothesis by most scientists in the field is still that it's um, that it evolved in a chronically infected um, person. But in the future, this is a definite, definitive possibility, which sort of further adds to the unpredictability of where this pandemic is going. Uh, do we have any other questions? Okay, so I think we should uh, thank Richard again. And our, our next event is going to be Wednesday, uh, May the 25th. It's going to be a 5 o'clock uh, Zoom talk by another frequent uh, visitor to KITP, Nicole Younger-Halpin. She has written a book, and it's uh, about combining quantum computing with thermodynamics. Uh, it's called Quantum Steampunk. So <laughs> stay tuned for that. And in the summer, we're planning to reinstate our Cafe KITP talks at Soho. So stay tuned for uh, future events and 
Thank you for coming tonight and thank you for your support.